Okay, we're here with we're here with Dustin Rhodes. Welcome, Dustin. Thanks for spending some time with us. All right, when uh, when Vince bought W when Vince bought WCW, what do you think would happen with your career? Well, at that point, I was a WCW, uh, you know, under contract with them, so I figured I could bite out the year and uh, get the pay that was coming my way. And then the last day, the the day before, um, you know. Uh, they had, they had one day to call me, and and they called me that day to cancel my uh, my contract, and they canceled out the rest of it, so I got paid for the rest of the year, and but not the next year. So, but it was fine. I mean, hey. Why do you think WCW failed? WCW, I don't think ever failed. Uh, WCW was always rocking on. They were doing good business, you know, and and it's just. Uh, one company's ego taking over another company, trying to show who's boss of you know what, and the power, the power of the McMahon, how much he can control, you know, and that kind of thing. And without two two companies, you know, there's just no. You watch one company, that's it. You need two. You need you need back to back so you can flip channels, you know, and it's fixing to come up like Spike, TNA. Um. Did your father give you any advice being in the business? Anything to like when? I guess when you know when you got in the business, did he send you down a certain road? Said do this, don't do this, or any advice? You know, just well, to help maybe steer your career. Right the advice comes from you know different fathers. You know, I I don't really recall any fatherly advice from dad about what uh, not to do, except for stay away from drugs and stay away from. Uh, all the you know the bullshit and the politics and stuff like that, but stay away from drugs mostly because Dad uh, really believed strongly in no drug uh, atmosphere, and and I was grown uh, up living in his house, you know, you know, not doing drugs and believing that that if I did smoke a joint or if I did do something like that, I'd get my ass kicked. So I didn't do drugs. How involved with your father were you in Turnbuckle Championship Wrestling? Well, he he made me his. Yeah, for the company it was, he made me the second-hand man, you know, and we ran our seminars and uh, trained a few people and had a few shows, you know, and, and uh, did some did some business, but, you know, for the independent companies out there, a lot of them struggle and a lot of them fail, and without big backers, without big money, you know, behind them, I mean, you, you're going to fail, you're not going to, I mean, you need money to, to make money, and that, that's something that uh, Turnbuckle didn't have. What were, you, what were your career plans at that time when you were involved in that? What were you thinking? Well, let's see. What year was that? That was the uh, first time after I left uh, WWE, WWF. Uh, you know, I was just, I was with Dad, wanting to make this, make his company, our company, as big as it could be, and do what we could, you know. But, uh, in, like I said, independent companies, they, they struggle, and there's so many of them out there, and everybody wants to be a wrestler. Everybody. I mean, they'll line up around the streets just to try out, just to train to become a professional wrestler because it's just what everyone wants to do. And then you see the packed arenas, the WWF, you know, WWE, and you see them all, and, and they're all, and you spotlight a few of them in the crowd, and you put a magnifying glass on them, and you know, you, you, they got the gleam in their eyes, they want to be a professional wrestler. It's like the Tough Enough deal, how they were lined up around the block, you know, to be one of those top five or ten or whatever it was, you know, to make it to the tough enough thing. How were you contacted about returning to the WWE? Uh, it was a Royal Rumble and I, they just contacted me and said, we want you to be a participant in the Royal Rumble, are you in shape? I said, yeah. And uh, they brought me in that way and then uh, after that day, the next TV, the next day was TV shooting for uh, Raw. And me and Jim Ross sat down for contractual uh, talks and came to an agreement and went from there. How has the locker room, room atmosphere changed since the last time you were there? Well, I'm not there now, so I don't. No, no. When you when you came back, when you when you came back at the uh, Royal Rumble, it just depends. You know, if 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 uh, if business is good, if the house shows are up, if they're doing good and everybody's happy, everybody's pleased with their matches and things like that, then. You know, everybody's pretty much taking care of their own and, and, and being kind and, and wonderful to everybody else. But, you know, if the, if the, 
the, the crowds are down and Vince McMahon is unpleased and if you know the office is just placed in you know not placed in general then yeah that kind of puts puts everybody else in the locker room in a kind of a state of like oh god we got to do something here but what can we do you know I mean and we can only do so much and uh, yeah you, you, you can see a difference you know the, the morale and the attitude of the people but they are few and, and I consider myself as one of those who try to keep the locker room up, you know, and being a goofy uh, Richard Pryor type of, you know, Chevy Chase, whatever, um, just make everybody laugh in the locker room kind of guy to try to keep the morale up, you know. When you, when you came back that night, you were in much better shape than you were in WCW. What did you do to get back into that shape? I rode the treadmill, man, and, and as everybody knows me as Dusty Rhodes' son, and you, you look at my father, you know, he's barely ever touched a weight in his life, and you know how he is, you know how big he is, and he uses charisma, and the way he talked on, on camera and things like that, and it's kind of went the same with me. I never really lift a lot of weights. I did a little bit, but I, I did a treadmill, and, and, and I ran it hard, and I ate a no-carb diet for, for like uh, a month and a half before I went back to WWF. And I lost 30 pounds just on that, you know, so I was in really good shape, but I wasn't muscle bound, you know, I wasn't Batista bound, that type of muscle, you know. I just, I'm tall, I had the gift of being tall, which was good, and I was in shape at that time. I could go without breathing, you know. When you went back, did you, was your mentality that this was your make or break opportunity when you went back? I didn't think of it as that. I thought, you know, this new opportunity, but I didn't think. It, that that gold dust would uh, exceed what he did, you know, the first time around, until given the opportunity with Booker, and when that happened, when the first thing with Booker happened, man, I knew something special was there, and our chemistry clicked, and and they had no they had no choice but to push it, you know, it was supposed to be a one-time deal that little vignette we did, and they kept on and on and on, and every every week. People tuned in. They wanted to see. Oh, there's Booker. You know, Gold Dust is by. Some, something's going to be funny here, going on here. Something's going to happen here. And, and I, I do, I do believe that 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 was a big part of uh, in those quarter where, wherever we were in the in the uh, hour, that quarter ratings were ours because people were wanting to see Booker and me and the funny stuff that we did, and that we were such an odd couple, like Jack Lemon and and Walter Matthau, you know, and and. We were such an odd couple, but we had chemistry, and it worked, and it clicked, and they had no reason but to just push it. Um, was there any discussions between you and your ex-wife before you came back? No. Did uh, did Vince give you any rules or ultimatums involving your ex-wife? No. When you came back for the Rumble, was was that just a night deal, or you signed a long-term deal at that point? Well, after that night, I did such a good job because I was bouncing around like crazy being 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 for everybody else <clears throat> and then the next day in Spartanburg uh, South Carolina sat down with Jim Ross and we came to a deal you know of a uh, contractual deal going into that match what was your attitude which one the Royal Rumble yeah I was a little nervous and uh, shame at man he was a, the one person who came up to me and he said you know this is your night you know and and I know they say that to everybody you know who's just coming in and doing their thing and this was my first time back and I was a little nervous and going to the Royal Rumble at such an early stage and standing there for so so long uh, I was a little nervous and uh, Shane said hey man hey you know this you're in shape this is your night shine like a motherfucker do it and I did I went in there and did it and I came back and Stephanie said damn you were bumping your ass off for everybody man you did a hell of a job and this and that so I was proud of that night and then that's what led to the next day and uh, contractual statements with Jim Ross and stuff and where we went from there. How different was it dealing with Johnny Ace than Jim Ross? I love Johnny Ace. Me and Johnny Ace always get along. Jim Ross and I, we get along. It's just uh, it's two different pair, you know, two different guys. Me and Jim Ross towards this, uh, the second uh, time I was there with Booker T, didn't always see eye to eye because of uh, some personal issues I'm not going to get into, but uh, I don't think any bad things about Jim Ross um, or Johnny. Johnny's, he, he did a good job with what he had with all the young talent and all the young writers that he had, 
And Brian, one of the best riders there they have there, he did some good stuff with me. He really did. He did most of our Booker and Go Dust uh, little skits, you know, and it was fun. Was Triple H any different when you went back that second, you know, when you went back that time? What was he the I same? saw a little bit uh, less of Triple H, you know, but every time I saw him, he was always also always very kind and cordial to me and stuff like that. But Triple H is Triple H, you know. He paid his dues and he paid his way and however he did it, you know, whether it was kissing ass or whether it was playing politics, he made it and he made it to the top. That's all you can say about it. And he's a good worker too. When you was his was his influence in the in the company more noticeable when you were at that time? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, because that's well, and right before that time, yeah, they were really pushing the crap out of him. So, you know, I mean, but they had no choice. He's a hell of a worker. He's a hell of a hand. And even though he might be playing politics and and. Um, Dating, dating Stephanie and stuff like that. It didn't matter. I mean, he had the talent, and he did a good job of what he had. You know, I just uh, a lot of guys don't play politics. A lot of guys don't do that and kiss ass. I'm not one of those guys, and that could have been my downfall and might not have been. But I'm one of those nice heart and soul guys that just can get along in the business with with what I can do with with my talent. I I consider myself one of the top ten in the business, the best in the business, as far as going out there psychology, psycho psychologically and, and getting in the ring and telling a story and making a match and making those people go from here to standing up and cheering a crowd or, or crying, you know. And Triple H, he's Triple H, you know. Were you, were you surprised that Kurt Henning got signed when you did? Mm -hmm. No, no, I wasn't surprised at all. I, I don't know why anybody would be surprised. Kurt Hennings, you know, Kurt Henning, Mr. Perfect. Okay. Um, whose idea was it to program you with, with Rob Van Dam? Uh, well, I would imagine that was Vince's. I mean, because that was my first, uh, my first um, feud was with Rob Van Dam. And uh, Rob Van Dam's over. Crazy, good. Gold dust coming back in, fresh, new. It was cool and made for a good, exciting setting, you know, and uh, I worked with it that one time, that one pay-per-view, and it, it went well, and that was that, you know. Um, he was the IC champion, I believe, at that time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you feel that your styles clashed with him? With who? Rob. Our Rob? styles? Yeah. They, they well, clashed. he has a completely different style, but uh, he also has the old school knowledge, you know. He just, he, he is able to do a lot more mobily, you know, doing the flips and the things like that than I am, you know, that, or that I can. I can't move like that, you know. And a lot of guys are gifted with that, and he's gifted with that, and he's unbelievable. He can do some tremendous stuff off the top ropes, and it's like a lot of the young guys, you know, that are coming up now in the TNA, you know, like AJ Styles and, and Daniels, Christopher Daniels. I mean, they, they can do three flips and land on their head and still get up. But one of these days, it's going to take a toll on their body, like Mick Foley. You know, after years and years of being pounded and pounded and thrown off of cages, it's going to take a toll on his body. This is my 18th year this month. And uh, it's taking a toll on my body, and I ain't done near the stuff that Mick's done. But falling down on your back 300 days a year, man, and, and traveling and this and that, it takes a toll and it beats the shit out of you. Thoughts on your run with the hardcore title? The hardcore title was a really short run, you know, and and then we went to the Res WrestleMania in uh, uh, Toronto, was it? Was it Toronto? Yeah, I think so. When Maven uh, took the hardcore title from me, but there was like two or three involved, and then uh, I beat him back in the dressing room on the on the stretching table, on the doctor's table again to keep my to retain my title. Hardcore titles, you know, it was just one of those things that, kind of like the ECW deal, just, you know, I, I don't think they should have put a hardcore title or anything like that at the beginning of a show like that. I think you should build a pay-per-view from the start to the finish, like this, the, the opening match, you know, should wrestle, do these things, second match, same thing, things, same, and you build up to that 
to the crescendo to the main event which is what everybody wants to see or the two main events the semi main event and the main event and uh, which is what they want to see and then they get to see it all you know when they see trash cans flying and and uh, when they ring the bell the bells flying and chairs flying the first match it kind of takes away from everything else you know it kind of takes away from the show even though the main eventers and the semi can can uh, follow it because of the talent they have it just takes away from it that's not the way I was raised you know old school ways you know you, if you're a curtain jerker not meaning in a bad way but that you open the show you open it for the next guy and then the next guy then the next guy and you build to the main event was it any different this time around um, for you with scripted promos and stuff like that was it different or did you still no not, not really I, I actually I enjoyed it a lot more this time with Booker because uh, we, we had some fun, man. I mean, we had some funny, funny scripts. And uh, we usually did them in one or two takes, you know. And like Brian, like was uh, one of the writers there, he was behind most of our our stuff that we did, you know, from the Crocodile Hunter skits to the all the skits that we did, you know, the, to the Scorpion Scorpion King skit, the first one, all the, the ones with Booker T in the bed with the girl. And I mean, all of them. I mean, he did some good writing. We ad libbed. He ad libbed to some some of those things, and uh, just our chemistry just it clicked. And you know, I look at Booker. You know, he looks at me and he see it on camera. It's like, huh? And the stuff we say back and forth to each other, you had to laugh because it was funny. And you tuned in next week to see, okay, there's Goldust. Booker's neck. He, he goes by. Oh God, damn, we gotta watch this. It's it's right here. It's gonna be a funny segment. Um, what kind of daily interaction, if any, did you have with your ex-wife? Say that again. Though? With what kind of daily interaction, with any, did you have with your ex-wife? Or did you guys not interact at all, really? Well, I mean, at, at TVs, you know, she was there, and I saw her, and said hello, and things like that. Um, but most of the time, she's in her locker room, doing whatever they do in the girls' locker room. I guess getting ready and stuff, or ready for giving the promos to the guys. I mean, we didn't have much reaction at all, you know, as far as yeah, any bad things to say about each other or anything like that. When you were back that time, who did you ride the road with? Was there anybody in particular? or uh, This this last time, um, I rode a lot with Booker. I rode a lot with Kane and uh, Christian and Regal. But most of the time, I traveled by myself. Okay. How surprised were you to see Eric Bischoff working there? It wasn't a surprise, you know, uh, sooner or later that was going to happen anyway, I believe. And I'm glad for Eric that, you know, that he's there and has a job and is doing what he's doing, you know, because he helped me out when I had to come back to WCW. Okay. Um, thoughts on your brief angle with the NWO? Well, that was very brief. But that was a good, that was a good little uh, vignette we did, though, too, with uh, Darth Vader, I think it was. It was uh, Darth Vader uh, and me and Booker and the Force is strong with you. Don't join, don't join the NWO or something like that. And then knocking on the door and Kevin Nash, you know, ripping the mask off and beating the, the crap out of me or whatever. But the Crocodile Hunter was with all of them, and that was my favorite vignette. And you know, to be and it was such a it's like a five shot deal, and we all did it in like a few takes. You know, and I was, I've was studied uh, Steve Irwin, the Crocodile Hunter, uh, the whole day before the show, and I watched him anyways all the time because I love the Crocodile Hunter, but I watched him and I was, I was looking at my script, all the things I had to say, and I'm trying to talk like Steve Irwin, trying to uh, get that Australian accent down and did very well. And then we got to the shoot, you know, where uh, the big show was laying on the couch and X-Pac was in the shower, and I would say, oh my God, this... Look, it's the big show Paponymous. We do not want to wake him. He is very, very angry, you know. And then x pac goes, what's going on? Oh, my God. It's a wiry-headed grease rat, you know. And then things take on from there, and they chase us down the hall. He chases me, and we run into a uh, run into a room, and I duck and duck and roll. And as soon as x pac runs in there, he gets his head kicked off by Booker T. So it, it, it took like five takes, as Shane McMahon wanted, five takes, but they were good, all of them. 
And uh, bless Xbox Hardy, he kept getting kicked in the face each time. Man. <laughs> <laughs> he had that name, yeah, sidekick from Booker. How did Kevin Nash change in the WWE as compared to WCW, if at all? Well, I've known Kevin, and Kevin's been Kevin since you know, WCW or WWE. And the way he's been to me has always been a good guy, and and we've always talked cordially to each other. You know, uh, not necessarily friends, but acquaintances. You know, and he's a good guy. I really like him a lot. Um, any memories of your matches with X Pac? Oh. Well, there's been there's been six man tag matches with X Pac and uh, very few single matches with X Pac. But every time I've been in the ring with him, he's always been there. And when he's ready to work, when he's when it's time to work, he's he's there, and he does his best. And he's very good at what he does. How hard was it was it to battle staying clean on the road? Staying clean. What What do you mean? You know, just staying clean, staying away from any kind of you know. Drugs or drinking? Is it? Is it? Well, is drugs. It, I, I, is, it, is, it, is it tough to stay? I mean, is it tough with all the well, devices out there? Well, you can tell my body. I've never done steroids, mm -hmm. and drugs. I never did drugs at that time, and the the only drugs that I did were prescription drugs for my back and and my knees and elbows and neck and stuff like that. Um, and alcohol, you know, from day one in the wrestling business, it's always been kind of like a a deal when after your match you go have a you know a couple beer, beers with the guys and stuff so that's as far as it went with me okay. uh, any thoughts on Steve Austin well I, I hear you know just from watching TV since I've been gone that he's doing movies now and I saw him in the uh, uh, the football movie the, the remake the longest, yard. the longest Yard and he's supposed to do a couple more movies a, a three movie deal or something like that and I've been watching the Rocks movies too, and his is getting better, you know. And he just played the gay guy in this last one, which was I, I thought was off the hook. It was funny as hell. He, he should, if he had a bigger part in that, he was phenomenal in that. I and thought. he had he had a lot of uh, he had a lot of uh, talking parts in there. He should have had more because he did a really good job. But Austin, I think he'll do a good job too acting, you know. Um, any memories of the Raw match in which Kevin Nash tore his quad? Yeah, I was right there. I was outside the ring and I saw it, boom, he fell right down right down in front of me, man. I, and I jumped right down to the UK and I could see that he was in pain in his leg. He, he could tell, you know, that he had messed up his leg pretty bad. And it's unfortunate for tall guys like that sometimes, just like Sid, say for instance, coming off the top rope or the second rope or whatever and just snapping his leg in half, you know. When you're tall-legged like that, and your adrenaline's going, you know, you don't really realize it. But when you see it on TV and it happens, it, it just goes, oh, it grosses you out. You know, these big guys that are so strong and powerful and, and uh, muscular, you know, that, that uh, something could happen to them like that, you know. And the leg just flipped over and Kevin Nash's quad just, boom, you saw it buckle and he laid right there. And I said, okay, okay. And we're calling for the medics to come out, you know, and it just... It sucks for any of the boys to get hurt. I hate that, you know. Do you think Kevin is still or can or can still be a draw today? Oh yes, definitely. Kevin's a big draw. It's a big draw if he's pushed the right way right now in any company around the world, yes, definitely. If he came back to WWE tomorrow and was pushed the right way, yes, big draw. Okay, the next one's gonna be a mouthful, so bear with me there. That's fine. Uh speaking of Kevin, he said a few months back about your father. We're doing Royal Wrestling and we're on Fox Sports Net. We're in the 27th largest metropolitan area and that's it. We should be, we should be doing urban wrestling. We're doing rural. Dusty sits, sits in the back of a pickup truck with hay bales. Hey Dusty, quick clue. A little something from me to you. Become Fat Joe. Have a couple of black, black babies and be in an Escalade. Then we'll, then, we'll, then we'll do a number of high ratings. What the fuck's going on? I'm 46 years old, and I'm the hippest guy in the room. What the fuck is that? Any thoughts on any of that whole... Well, who wrote that? Did, did that come out of his mouth for sure? Well, he, he, supposedly he... he it was, was actually a printed he, interview from... Okay, well, with the Kevin porch. Nash, you know, he had a big... Uh, they built up a big deal for him and Jeff Jarrett, you know, in the press conference deal for the world title. And, uh, you know, uh, I love Kevin. He's a good guy. And Kevin has a unique... Since he sees a lot too, he's very, very creative too, you know. 
and not everybody agrees with my dad on his creative abilities or anybody else's you know everybody has their own creative abilities and if he said something like that then he saw something different that might have worked or whatever you know and you just gotta go with it I don't, I don't think bad about that you know whose idea you think it was to team you and you and uh, Booker T up Vince's or that there was a plan it, behind it, it? It was Vince's idea probably I guess or it could have been the writers I don't know Okay. I, I really don't know but the one time they hooked us up it worked so they had to push it, you know. Couldn't just let it. They couldn't just throw it in the trash bin. How friendly were you with Booker before? Very friendly. Before We've been him? friends a long time. Yes. Okay. Um, any thoughts on the Undertaker? Undertaker is is uh, Vince's man. I mean, Undertaker and me. We've had some tremendous matches together, and I think I'm the only person who has ever beat him actually in a casket match. Uh, actually, really, truly, the only person to beat him in a casket match. Thanks to mankind helping me, but I, yeah, Undertaker's a great guy. He's got a good business sense, business knowledge, his creative abilities. He watches the talent that comes in and out of the ring. And and one night, uh, this was right before Brock was just getting to be pushed, you know, to the top. Me and Undertaker are standing there at the curtain, and we're watching Brock. He was working with uh, Big Show, and Undertaker looked at me and said, "You think he's ready?" I said, yeah, I do, man, because he's caught on to it really fast, and he's got a good head on his shoulders, and, he, you know, he is ready, because I'm, I'm good friends with Brock. And Undertaker said, yeah, you know what, I think he's ready, too, you know. It's just little things like that. Uh, thoughts on Bubba Ray Dudley? What about him? What do you, you know, think of as a wrestler, person? I love person? the Dudleys. I love yeah. him. I always had a good time with him, man, just politicking and having fun with him. You know, in a match or without a match, just sitting there listening to their match and then discussing stuff, or, or the match that uh, the uh, ten man deal match we had when we, me and Booker won the titles. You know, it, it was it was a lot of fun, and you know there are a lot of politics there, but uh, I never played the politic game, and and me and Booker, the way we got over is just because we got over it and they couldn't stop it, you know, so they had to push it. And sooner or later they had to put the titles on us. And they did, finally, which was a good thing. And the people popped. People popped like crazy when we finally won the titles. How, how was it working with Chris Jericho? Unbelievable. Him and Christian both, me and Booker, Christian and Jericho, it's unbelievable. We can have some Excuse me, motherfucking matches. I mean, some great matches. We did. We had some great matches. Um, were you and Booker, or either one of you, upset when you got squashed that time by three-minute warning? You had to tell me when that was. I don't recall that. Uh, they, remember, they were they were they were doing that thing, three-minute warning. They were coming in. They were squashing this one, squashing that one, and they came in and. They squashed you. They did the same thing to you guys. You know. They didn't squash us though, didn't they? Squash like mini dust. Was it? Was it? Mini? The little mini gold dust, the midget. I thought. It, I thought. Yeah. Didn't was we it? get out of the ring before they squashed us, and they squashed uh, mini gold yeah. dust? Okay. Well, maybe, yeah. And put yeah. him in the hospital. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I love Rosie and Jamal. Those are two boys. They're good boys. Good friends. Um. Any good any memories of the Las Vegas showgirl, showgirl match with William Regal? Okay, let me think about that for a minute. Uh, I remember us being in the the uh, the pre-tape when we were shooting the deal with the wheel, and I was in the back. Uh, I can't remember what what it was though. You have to recall. You know, give me what what happened during that match. The, sh the showgirls at ring. Oh, that's that. when I was dancing. Yeah. <laughs> and Riga was dancing? Yeah. 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 That was fun. Hey, man. I mean, it was fun. Shit. To see Riga on the get up like that, and I've already done it, hell, since 96. I didn't give a shit, you know. It didn't bother me, but to see Riga on it was really funny. Dancing like a damn showgirl in a dress and high heels, man. I'm shit. <laughs> How approachable with ideas are the writers? Were the writers there at that time? It depends on who you were. You know, if you're top five, six guys, they're always up in you talking new ideas or whatever. And if you're not, and you're a pol you know, politician, you're walking up to them, you're staring in their face all the time. And that's not the type of person I was, but 
uh, those, you know, they, get, they, they took pretty good care of me and Booker until they didn't want us to work anymore, until they wanted Booker to go his own way and me to do the same thing I did with Booker, which was with Booker's help, but to do the same thing with Booker with Lance Storm. And Lance Storm, you know, the bookworm, the smart guy, great worker, great uh, technician and all that stuff. We tried to do that stuff. And I, but I couldn't, in my head, I was like, why are they breaking us up? We're doing so good right now. And, uh, you know, and then they put me with Lance. And I hurt my, I got hurt, you know, during a few of those uh, vignettes, after a few. And uh, it just, when I got hurt, kind of went down from there and that's when I got let go, you know, but I mean, politics are everything up there, you know, it is. And uh, the riders, they're all young and now that my father's there, he's been there for two weeks now and I don't know what the slow riders are, how many of them are up there, at least 10, I would guess, or eight or whatever, and they're all 20s, 21, 24 years old and now you have dad sitting in on the on the uh, the riding uh, team hopefully we can see a little change you know because um, I know my dad is is uh, he's done that all his life you know he's been the booker been the booker over and over and over and he knows how to create and knows how to write but you know at the same time he dad has to realize you know this old school which I believe in old school will never die but you got to take the old school and you got to put the new school in there with it because you see the new guys and you see what they do, and you got to you got to combine them both and 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 then get some chemistry out of that and make a story out of that. And that's hard to do, but Dad has seen that I think and I think he can do it, and I hope he does. I wish him well. Um, it's only his second week, so we'll see next week. And, yeah, you know if the TV gets a little bit better, if the ratings get a little better, whatever. Do you think if you know if, if your dad works out there, that that would pave any road for maybe you getting another shot? I think I think I still have one one shot left yeah. to go there. You know? uh, one more run is gold dust, and I'll take it. I'll take one more run as gold dust and do the best I can with it. I I got gold dust over the first time with Vince's help. He gave me the reins, and I was the most hated heel for a year. And then the second time, me and Booker were over like. Like some bitches, man. I mean, big time. So that, that and they were two different, two different kinds. You know, there was a hated gold dust, and there was a good gold dust with Booker. So I think that, yeah, if I came back uh, a third time and we did something creatively, yes, uh, gold dust could get over one more time and have another good run, and then go home. You know. A couple times you've mentioned so far tonight, um, Christian. Yeah. It seems like you think highly of that guy. You I know, love him. What a, you know just. He's a great worker, you know, yeah. talker, and then and they're still not giving him the proper push over there. They, they are, but they're not, you know. I, it's just like half the guys up there now that are being pushed, and I'm not talking about Batista and Orton and and those guys, but the, the new guys that are coming up that don't know how to lace their boots, you know. And I ain't even seen them because I've lost my satellite because of money. So I hadn't been able to watch TV and watch the show for the last month. And But from what I hear, the new guys, this is just from what I hear, the new guys that are coming in there, they're just throwing the ball, you know, hoping they can carry it, and they're not doing a good job. And I don't know. I, I just hear that the product is not real good right now. And, you know, Vince, is, Vince has got to say, hey, man, we got to and grab back the reins himself, you know. I mean, Stephanie does a wonderful job. She's got a great head on her shoulders as far as the business. I mean, her or the family, of uh, Shane and, and everybody, I mean, if the business gets turned over, I think it would be turned over to her and Hunter, you know. And uh, and she has a wonderful, wonderful look at the business and knows how to do stuff, knows how to write things. But then you need direction from writers and things like that. But you don't need 15 writers. You know, a couple, two or three writers is all you need. And they have such a slew of riders going different directions, and everybody's spitting different things in your head. What can you do? I mean, you like, I'll pick one, pick one. It's tough. I can just imagine what she's going through. It's, it's got to be hard. Um, why do you think DVP never worked out in the WWE? 
I really don't know because when I was there, he came in, did his little stand, but then all of a sudden he was gone. And I don't know the reasons why or w the reason for it waving or, or whatever. I don't know. Okay. Um, was it special for you when you got the tag straps with everything you had gone through in your career or was it just another day at work? No, it was very special. Me and Booker worked very hard for those titles. And I know Booker, you know, has had, had the titles, titles and titles and titles with his brother and, and, the, and the WCW heavyweight title and all this and that. It was very special to finally, after pushing us for so long, you know, because they had no reason, I mean, no reason not to, because we were getting over so well, you know, the ratings were so good that eventually you had to, you know, you had to put, politics couldn't stop it. He had to put the titles on us. It was very special. It was a good, good feeling from a big high point for me. Like winning the Intercontinental title, you know, and doing the first Gold Dust run. Booker T and me, and the second run was a big high point. How competitive, how competitive was it for spots within the locker room at that time? It was pretty, pretty competitive because they had so many guys coming in, you know, and you had to be on your heels. And uh, the new guys you'd see come on Sunday Night Heat and you'd watch them. And uh, one of the best, one of my best buddies, you know, was Stephen Richards. And we had, hell, you could go to Blockbuster and sell a, uh, uh, a best of series of me and Stephen Richards. We had so many Sunday Night Heat matches. But they'd put, put some guy like I heard after I'd left. Uh, with Stephen Richards, and he was supposed to do a hammer or something to to his chest, and just caved in his whole face, and you know didn't know what he was doing. But this big guy, you know, they push these big guys, they put them in there before they know what they're doing. And I don't know the guy, I don't mean any bad things about him, but they just they put people in there that don't know what they're doing. They're green as frogs, and and it hurt Stephen Richards. It caved in his whole face, it broke his face facial bones, his nose, everything, you know, and Stephen Richards is one of the best workers there in the WWE, and he should be getting getting some pushes, you know, at least mid-card or upper card, I mean, because Stephen Richards is a hell of a worker, I love him. Um, who, who came up with the uh, the Tourette's gimmick, and what did you think of it? The Tourette's gimmick was, a, was like a fluke, it's like in 98... 97, 98, when I was gold dust back then, I, you know, I would be walking in the airport and just, I saw Jenny, or Jerry Springer, and I saw the panel of the Tourette's, where they're all sitting there and they're screaming out stuff, you know, and yeah, and they're cursing and this and that, and I just looked at that and I started doing it in the airports with the boys, and they're like, <laughs> they, they started laughing, they didn't know where it came from, I was like, ew, ew, do, 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 you know, and start. And then we would get on an airplane. Here was the real funny things. I'd be sitting next to, you know, back in coach, you know, next to the window, next to an old couple. A woman would be sitting next to me, an old lady, like 80, 80 years old, 70, old man. And then, say, Val Venus is sitting across on the next aisle. And out of the middle of nowhere, we'd be flying to Halifax, Nova Scotia, or somewhere. I'd go, ah, ah, and she'd start flipping out. And this old lady next to me would be going, <coughs> She'd start laughing and Val would go, no, 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 don't laugh at him, don't laugh at him, he's got Tourette's, he takes it very serious and personal. And I would go, mm, 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 and I'd just start doing off the wall stuff, you know, and uh, don't laugh at him. And you did people in the back, but they'd be laughing at me. And uh, and Val would ask me, did you take your medication this morning? And I'd, I'd be like, mm, no, 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 I didn't. I left at the building, I left the hotel. You know, and they're like, oh gosh, you know, they'd, they'd be playing along with me. They just play along with me. It's like like a wrestling match. It was fun, and that built to how I, I don't know where it came from, but somebody mentioned it. Let's do this, you know, the Tourette's deal, and electrocute your ass, and <laughs> and you go into your Tourette's phase, you know. So, but it was that was like two years before where I was just doing that in the airport just for the boys' amusement, just having fun because I like to make everybody laugh, you know, and it, that that's how I got there. Uh, any thoughts on your mini program with Evolution? Well, it was a mini program. Maybe you can help me out on how long a program that was. 
It's, it was real small. It was it was really small. I think they just Batiste were, and, and, and right, uh, right. Brandy when they threw me into the electrical right, deal. Right, I right. You're I think little, that's about all it was. Wasn't that's it? All, yeah. Yeah. So it was, all it was. Yes, all it was. Um, do you think Randy Orton and Batista are the future of the WWE? I think Randy Orton's got great great potential. Batista has learned a lot. He still needs to learn a lot, but he's doing a great job, and uh, he's been given the ball. You know, I mean. He's learning. They're both very good, you know. Very few guys, <coughs> excuse me, that have caught on to the business so quickly, like like myself when they when Dad named me the Natural when I started, you know. And uh, Angle, Angle was one that that caught it just like that. And uh, Orton, he caught it just like that. It's it has to. I think it has to do it all genetically, you know, with your fathers and sons in the business and stuff. And Batista, he caught it just like that, and he happens to be a big son bitch. And you know, I mean, he can do the do the right stuff. You know, Psych psychologically, if you're in there with him, you can lead him around and help him. But 50 percent, six, maybe 75 percent, he knows basically what to do. You know, and he's learning each day by day. And but the rest of the guys, I'm not even looking at those those guys right there. Are, you know, and and the new guys I haven't seen. With the last couple months, because I hadn't had cable, so you got to tell me who's coming up, who's who's next in line, who's what. Uh, speaking of Kurt, you mentioned Kurt Angle. Yeah. Do you, uh, how far do you think his career really could have went? That top, but they wouldn't have had all those starts and stops and made a comedy act out of him. You know, up and down, up and down. Do you think he really he could have been? Well, every time he was on TV, he was always getting cheered. You know, I mean, Kurt Angle. I mean, he. He knew how to do it, and his, his, psychology-wise, he could do it. Uh, and another guy I forgot to mention was Cena. Cena is learning how to do it, and he's doing a damn good job at it, you know. And now they got the little spin deal, you know, for the entertainment value of the belt and stuff like that. But he does a good job, you know. But Benoit and and uh, uh, the Guerreros, you know, and Christian and, and Chris Jericho. Those are the guys I would rely on, you know, and uh, Booker and uh, Bradshaw, you know, all those guys, those top guys there, Undertaker, but I know he's kind of stepped out a little bit, you know, but all those guys are the guys you got to rely on, you know, and everybody else coming up is, they, they're they going to have to learn real fast. If they don't, you know, I don't know what's going to go, if this business will go to hell in a handbasket or what, man, because... There's so many people that want to become a professional wrestler. And I'm fixing to open a wrestling school, and uh, I'm going to run some shows, but I'm going to open a wrestling school in Oklahoma here in the next few months. And uh, it's not under my dad. I'm doing it on my own, finally. I'm going to do something on my own, you know, and train these guys and, and try to teach them the psychology of it because it's hard to learn the psychology. You either know it or you don't. You're either natural or you're not. And... There's so many people out there that want to be a wrestler, you know. I mean, you just look, you, you take tough enough, for instance. How many people are lined up, you know, waiting to get in, you know. It's just, it was amazing to watch that. And hopefully I can uh, put some, maybe me and Vince can come to an agreement where I can be his developmental school, you know, somewhere down the line, because I'm fixing to do it. I'm going, I mean, 110% forward with it, so. Did you know uh, Randy, Randy Orton or The Rock growing up? I knew uh, uh, Rock a little bit, not Randy. Not Randy? Just his dad. Um, all of a sudden, you and, and you and Booker are back on top beating Flair and uh, Triple H before WrestleMania. Did Triple H push for this feud, or how did this feud come about? I don't even remember that match. We beat them. Yeah, it was a few that you guys had, and you guys, yeah, you guys had a little run there, and you guys rest right, right before WrestleMania. And what happened after that? I, as usual, they, you know, moved on different ways. But I did, you know, was, well, we beat them. Yeah. On TV. Yeah. I don't remember that to be honest with you. Okay. Um, whose idea was it for your skits with Test and Stacy? Did you write that? Did you write them all, or? That was Brian's. That was Brian, one of the writers. It was uh, uh, his skit with the Playboy deal and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. 
it was his deal, that, which was one of my favorites too. I like that skit. Uh, and Tess is a good guy. Is he still there? No, he got to let go, didn't he? He got to let go. But, uh, it, you know, it was all in fun, man. But they got a good group of riders, a few, a few of them. Brian is one of them. And uh, hopefully Dad will shed some men some insight, you know, some light on these younger fellas to, uh, you know, get a little bit of the old school and the and the new, you know. But now that Dad knows that they do so many pre-tapes and, and uh, vignettes in the back, he can probably help out a lot in that because he knows how to do that. Uh, was there anything that, that they suggested for you to do that you refused or that you thought had ideas that they refused? Like for your character, was there anything like that you know that they wanted you to do? Do you have any instances? Do you have any? No. Was there was there anything like they they said, you know, Dust Gold Dust do this, and you were like, ah, you know, that's pushing the envelope a little far. Or was there anything you wanted to do to push that envelope, and they said, ah, you know, maybe not. Well, well, at the beginning, you know, Vince gave me Gold Dust, and he gave me the range, you know, and the envelope was wide the fuck open. I mean, we went with it, and uh, that's when he had the click there, you know, and the click was politics and they were bringing down everybody that wasn't part of the clique but I wasn't part of the clique but Vince was pushing me so I had no worries and uh, I could see it happening to certain people but uh, Vince still was going with me until I got gold dust over um, and I owe a big part of that to Savio Vega you know um, getting gold dust over as, as the number one hated heel you know and then you know, Scott Hall, I love Scott Hall. He didn't want to do his stuff with me for certain reasons. And, you know, we had conversations and talks, and then we came to an agreement. We were fine after that. And what was the question? <laughs> um, was, there, was there anything that they wanted you to do at, okay. in, with that gimmick or that you wanted okay. to do that either one of you okay. didn't, weren't comfortable with? And, and we would go on with that, and Goldust would get so high that the gay and rights activists would call in, or yeah, moms of children would call and say, hey, we're not gonna let our children watch this, you know, crap again. And Vince would let it go for a couple weeks because the rates would jump up higher, even though they said that, right? Even though the gay and rights activists were writing in and all this and that. And then when it got to a certain point, then he would pull the envelope down just a little bit and say, we need to close it down just a little bit. I say, okay, that's fine. And then he would give me the okay to step it up a notch again. You know, we had to go back and forth. We had to play pitter-patter a little bit. And then at, towards the end of that, it just kind of, you know, flattened the gold dust. But we made a good run with it. Um, how did you find out that Howard Stern was a big fan of your gimmick? Did you... I had no idea that Howard Stern was a big fan of my gimmick. You know, I just, uh, I was invited to go on a show when they told me. And we went and... Um, the guy in the back of Howard Stern that sits behind him, yeah. not Arnie, um, I'm uh, trying to do my gimmick right yeah. there, you know, with Howard, right. and the other guy in the back's like, he mm ain't -hmm, doing it too, mm -hmm. and, you know, was, wasn't doing a good job of it, you know, and Howard's getting on to him, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to do this gimmick and, and Howard's asked me if I take medication for it and I just made up a name. I said tri Triziptocaine. That was my medication I was taking for Tourette's. I made up that name, Triziptocaine. And you know, it was just, uh, and from what I understand, they still play the, the Howard Stern deals, you know, with me on it. It's today, they still play it. And which, that is a big, uh, that's... Well, that, I'm honored, man. That's cool, you know, to, to be on his show and to do that and have fun, and for him to still be playing my stuff is it means a lot. I always wanted to do Saturday Night Live, you know. I did Conan O'Brien. I always wanted to do David Letterman, but Conan O'Brien was cool too. I mean, you know, I did a, a bunch of things. I never did Regis and Kathy and Regis or whatever, the, whatever the show was. Regis Phil, but um, but I did a few, you know, and they were fun and you know. When you, when you were on Stern that time, why do you think that uh, that appearance wasn't promoted on WWE TV? I didn't know that it wasn't. Yeah, they didn't promote... They didn't... They, nothing wasn't even... Um, do you think that Hunter puts himself over too much at the benefit of the company? Uh, explain that a little bit. 
Um, well, sometimes you know, Hunter puts himself over as the you know as the the champ and and doesn't look at look around at the big picture maybe, and the other guys maybe are sacrificing because of that. Well, you got to look at all the guys that Hunter has to deal with. Most of them are, are green, you know. Most of them are aren't ready. So if you're the world champ like Hunter is, and a, you know the worker that he is. Yeah, you got to say that. You know that that just gives more boost and ammo for the young guys to get up and say, "Hey, we need to we need to make our mark. We need to do this. We need to get to where he needs us to be." You know. Do you think that that Hunter, um, basically like like your dad back in the day, gets too much blame for? any problems that, you know, the company has. Okay, well, let's, let's break that down into two. My dad got the blame for what? Yeah, your dad, well, your dad, your dad was back in the day when he was, you know, when, when he was a booker for... Well, not even a booker, when he was, you know, when he was, the, you know, the, the big dog there yeah. back in the day, and then and, and he was the booker or whatever, he, and he pushed himself. He used to get a lot of blame that, that he was the downfall of the company when other people around yeah, were... were but, but you gotta, you got to also realize, too, that back in the day, you know, Dusty Rhodes, being as big as he was, I mean, and pushing himself, he still had all the other guys that he pushed, too. Even though he's out there doing his elbows and drawing the crowds and things like that, he still had help from everybody else. He didn't, he didn't put too much into him. He just was being him, you know, and what the people wanted to see. And Hunter, I think it's the same way. Hunter... Uh, well, he is a top draw, and, and Hunter with Shawn Michaels, whether it be with Kevin Nash, whether it be with anybody that she had uh, feuds with and things like that, yeah, you're going to push that, but you also, you know, just business-wise, you know who is right down there, right beneath you, I mean, just on your heels, that you got to push to and that you got to lead, and, and uh, you don't overlook him. He hasn't overlooked him. Um. How did you hurt, injure your elbow that time? I injured my elbow in Australia in a match uh, with me and Booker, Kristen, and Jericho, actually. And I have hyperextended it and uh, tore some tendons and uh, came back, you know, and I needed uh, four weeks off, so they gave me the four weeks off. And then came back again and uh, I wasn't ready, or they said I need six weeks off. And I went four weeks, and I came back to TV four weeks, and they wanted to put me in uh, Booker in a squash match with uh, uh, John with Mark Henry. And Arn Anderson looked at me and said, "Are you ready yet? Are you cleared?" I said, "No, I'm not. You know, my elbow's still messed up. I still need two weeks." So they, uh, you know, I went along with the match anyways, and I didn't do anything but one thing. We we got the match to where it was. I could only do one thing, which was Mark Hen Henry doing his slam finish, which slammed my elbow down, and injured it again. I was out for another six weeks, and the WWE, they, they I guess they just saw it as, okay, we just need to let him go. You know, it's in his contract right now. He's taking too too much time for his elbow. My elbow was fucked up. You know, I mean, I couldn't do nothing about it. Um, I was trying my best, but the elbow's fucked up. It's fucked up. You can't really work with a bad elbow. You can work with a broken hand and stuff like that in a cast, but an elbow is, you're limited, you know? Because any way you land, it just kind of bends. And and they they called me and said, listen, we're going to let you go on your contract unless you can come up with um, some ideas maybe to bring you back. And they, they're they giving me this, uh, this, this pleasure of, of uh, coming up with some ideas to let Goldust stay in, you know. And within 24 hours, I had had like eight ideas that I submitted to him and faxed to him. And, um, you know, they they just said, no, well, well, and they got a whole team full of writers, you know. That's what the writers are for, to write, to come up with ideas for us wrestlers, right. And I'm thinking that the whole time, why, why, you know, they're not coming up with something for me. It must be just because they're ready for me to get out. I, you know, it's no big deal. Business is business. I came up with the ideas. They shunned them down, and I was let go. So, so, so basically, you think you, you think you put too much pressure on yourself at that time, and then they were pressuring you to come back. So it was like a twofold thing for you there. 
Well, I came back, you know, when I wasn't ready, but I came back anyways because the old school in me, you know, that, that uh, the old school never dies, man. I believe in old school ways, just like you heard a lot today, you know, the old school ways, us going in hurt and this and that. And, you know, my elbow wasn't fully ready yet, but I could get in there and do it. It's just one slap, bam, on the mat, it was going to fuck it up again. And it did. And it was nobody's fault but my own for going back. But I understand their their meanings and ways of saying, "Hey, you know, we ain't got nothing for you. It's okay." Was it was it hard to avoid or limit your use of pain pills at that time? No, nope, because I've been on painkillers since uh, 1993. You know, for my back, because my L4 and 5, I have no discs in there. This is bone on bone, you know. And since I broke my hand with Road Dog. I'm, and uh, my knees, I mean, I live on painkillers, you know. I, I don't take them uh, to get high, things like that, but I take them for my pain because I need them, and I will overdo them. I mean, I take the amount that the doctor tells me to take, but uh, the painkillers, you know, I need them every day. If I don't have them, then I can barely get out of bed, you know. It's, it's very tough for me to get out of bed in the morning. Thanks for hanging tight, Dustin. Um, well, let's start off. What, ha what happened, if anything, you can add some, shed some light onto it on the so-called plane ride from hell? Do you have anything about it? Anything the hell went on there? Or? I just uh, hear a lot of hearsay, you know. I mean, uh, I knew they, uh, the girls, I guess, that were on the flight, the stewardesses or the flight attendants had a lawsuit against WWE, and they poked our names in their minds, Scott Halls and Ric Flair's. And... Uh, uh, you know, it's just, I know it's dropped because they had no evidence and stuff, which is basically why I was sleeping the whole fight. And, uh, you know, there there was one point where the, the one of the blonde girls had Ric Flair's robe on and she was completely naked underneath. And that's when we were all landed in, uh, like, Heath, at Heathrow, London. And uh, we're all on the bus waiting. And she comes walking out on the big stair deal like you know the president's staircase deal and she's got Ric Flair's gold and red robe on and Rick, Rick walks out woo like that uh, but er everything else you know what I was uh, blamed for or you know, stuff like that was like filling her up or something I was laying down the whole flight so and uh, I, I dip a lot of tobacco I dip four cans a day and I was laying down, and I guess my cup spilled over, you know, while I was sleeping. And uh, Jim Ross fined me $5,000, basically, which is basically a good cleanup of the plane, instead of a little spot of dip spit spilled there, you know. So that's the only bad thing that I, that I really hated, because it was a bunch of BS. So, so basically then, you think you, uh, you didn't deserve to be punished? No, I didn't, I didn't do anything wrong. And, and uh, I guess others were wrongly punished too, also? And I don't know who, who did anything wrong. Mm -hmm. The only thing I did know is that uh, Michael Hayes got, got his lights punched out by Bradshaw. And, uh, and uh, Brock and Mr. Perfect, they wrestled a little bit by the big door, which could have come open, but nothing happened, you know. Besides that, nothing happened, you know. It was just a, a good fight, and then I went to sleep. Uh, is the you say the lawsuit was settled, or you haven't heard any more about it, or haven't heard any more about it, which I think it's been dropped, probably. I, I mean, it's been a year and a half now. Shit. You know, are you embarrassed by that incident that you got roped into that whole thing, and you really weren't? Not really. I'm, I'm not embarrassed. I just, you know, when when you hear your name on the internet, and and these days everybody just is eating you up on the internet, you know. It's, it's not always true, you know. You can't always believe what what is on the internet. Like what I just went through with my ex-girlfriend, you know. It's been tacked all over the internet, you know. And I've just been proven not guilty. And the people, you know, they put a magnifying glass on it and make it bigger than it fucking is. And it sucks. It makes us, it makes, you know, it brings down your your credibility and everything until they actually know the truth, you know. And I've been proven not guilty so now all the people can can go back to their business and, and, and switch hands and jack off with their other hand and fucking come up with some other bullshit story because in mine, I was not guilty. 
was, was it or hard? if you're playing switch if you're going like this and the other thumbs up your ass switch stick your other thumb up your ass and think of another story because it's a bunch of bullshit basically was it hard to mentally adjust to coming from the top of the world to crashing back down again because you were up there you, you know you made it back and then it was over again Crashing down in what sense? So, you well, know, no. just getting let go by the WWE. Yeah, you know, you 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 had you, had, you know, you climbed your way. You know, you were down here and you climbed your way all the way back up, and then oh no, shit, no. here yeah, we are I, again. I don't have anything bad to say about that. It's just, you know, I had two good runs with uh, with uh, Vince, and and uh, I filled my own shoes as Gold Dust instead of trying to fill my dad's shoes as Dusty Rhodes' son, and now. If I'm me and Dad are doing a lot of tours together now, I'm more than happy, you know, and I'm happy, you know. We we've got our lives back together, me and Dad, and I know my job now. When we go in the ring together, and it's fun as hell because it's little <laughs> spot shows. Okay, Dad, don't worry, I got this. Um, I get in the ring, I get beat up. He comes in, I give him the tag. He drops his elbows. Boom, boom, boom. One, two, three. We get paid. We go home. That's the funnest thing for me right now. Was was there ever a point that you uh, were thinking about retiring, or are you thinking about retiring? Uh, that's really not part of the uh, equation right now for you. Well, no, I look at I look at uh, like the TNA stars right now, AJ Styles and Christopher Daniels, and all the young flyers, man. And and one of the what made me really think something along those lines was one of the last pay per views I was at, not the last one before I got thrown in jail, April twenty fourth. It was a pay-per-view before that and they had an X Division match and Christopher uh, or, uh, AJ grabbed up on that uh, X that red rope man and he, he like did some kind of back flip and it was like a double back flip and he landed on his neck and I was like ah oh, we're on the back going ah damn he broke his neck you know and he got right up and I'm like wow you know and I get up on the second rope now, or I can get up on the second rope, or the third, the third rope. My last pay per view, and I bulldogged uh, Bobby Roode off the third, you know, rope, which I hadn't done in a long, long time, which is a long ways. It's it takes a toll on your body, but getting up on the second rope my, now, my knees are shaking, you know, unless it's a superplex or something easy, you know. And doing the flips and all that stuff, like like Brock when he did the uh, the gainer. In Seattle at the WrestleMania, and landed on his neck, and barely made it, barely mm. skidded through. And he did that. Uh, what was it, Mark Merrill? Yeah, he did a, the moonsault. Right? He, no, uh, no, uh, he, he went. Had the 450, four shooting star. Yeah, shooting star. And his neck went and just barely made it. You know, and I was, we were all up in the box going, oh, see, I can't do that stuff, you know. And I, I just rely on my old school abilities and how I can work because I know I'm one of the best workers in the world and psychologically I can I work just a, a ton of them. I'm one of the top ten best and I know I am and I can work circles around green some bitches. I can't do flips like them but I can work around them. Do you think that if uh, JR was in Johnny Ace's position at the time you would have been able to keep your job? No. Do you think you could fit into the current WWE product today? Yeah. Would you like to, I guess you know, you would like to go back to the WWE. Sure. Yeah. One more time, yeah. One more good run. Um, if done right, I mean, shit. Do you have to work or are you, are you, are you financially set? I have to work right now. I'm trying to uh, find different jobs, what I can do. But, I mean, what's my resume? WWF. You know? I mean, uh, I've... Uh, applied for different jobs for laying cable and things like that, you know, for, for, uh, I mean, uh, uh, high cable, like, uh, what's it called, uh, um, fiber optics cable and stuff like that for big buildings and computer connections and stuff. You gotta get, you know, you have to be trained for it a little bit, but my brother-in-law does that and he can help me with that, but I'm not gonna go to fucking McDonald's to the goddamn golden arches and make five fucking dollars an hour, that's not gonna pay my bills. Fuck Ronald McDonald. I mean, fuck fast food, you know. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna do something else that I like, you know. I can make eleven dollars cutting grass somewhere, you know, or something. But all I know is wrestling, you know, and that's all I really want to do. And I'm getting a chance right now to make a choice and, and, and go out to Oklahoma and open up a new territory myself, just me. 
and uh, open up a new set of you know, set of guys, you know, and two rings and a school and make it like a dojo. And this is this is what I want to do, you know. Instead of the typical school, I want to uh, this this steel building. We're going to have our school in. We we'll have two rings. The first ring is your beginner's ring. That's where everybody starts. And I train eight people for three months. And in that that uh, three months, they live there at the building. You know, we got bunk beds. We got four rooms for you know eight people. They live there. They have their own transportation and stuff like that. But they live there. They train there. Then they graduate from the first ring to the second ring. The second ring is the the big boys ring where they graduate and then they get promoters' names and numbers and things like that and send tapes to Vince, send tapes to uh, whoever, you know, Dixie Carter, you know, whatever, Jeff Jarrett, and then that's all we can promise them, but we train them in the meantime, and maybe that'll be a place that Vince would like to send some of his de developmental ta talent down to, but get that started and run a town in Oklahoma once a week in one town instead of doing several towns, one town, and see how I can build it, you know. Because I know I can, and Dad and me have a little different views on how to do things like that. And I know Dad knows what he's talking about, but I know the new era, the new ways that, that, that people think, the new kids that are coming up and stuff, you know, things like that. And this is being given to me, and I'm going to take it, and I'm going to make some of it. And if it turns out to be a big, big promotional, or a big promotion, and, and growing and growing and growing, and then... Then we go from there because my backer, you know, he owns a lot of uh, the Indian casino, Indian casinos in Oklahoma, and then we go from there, man. And I mean, you might have a third. You have WWE and TNA, and then, boom, mine, whatever, you know. But that, that's years to come. But I, I got to start somewhere. But at least I'm gonna be taken care of. I'll be getting paid for it, and doing this and training people, which is what I love to do, and showing them what the fuck they're doing wrong or what they're doing right, or if they ain't worth the shit, if they need to hit the road or go or what, you know, and giving the little guys a chance, you know. You know, you've been up and down many roads and different people. Is there a particular road story that, you know, you could share, like, you know, good time on the road or bad time on the road, you know, something, a road story that, you know, you've been, you traveled so many people, so many different highways. Is there anything that you could just, well, you know? Well, there's so many, you know, you just, to pinpoint one, you know, I've had a lot of good road stories with Barry Wyndham. Which, you know, he's like closer than a brother to me, you know, we've known each other forever. And then Dad, to be actually in the ring with Dad, that first time I was in the ring with Dad, the Royal Rumble, uh, was was awesome, you know. And then to be in the ring with him now, it's just, it's it's fun, you know. And we, and we sit and we drive and we talk stories and things like that. And to wrestle with Barry, you know, and uh, be in his, at WCW when he was there, when they were doing the Texas, uh, um, the, uh, yeah. no, when, when, when they were doing the Rednecks. Texas the Redneck, redneck yeah. <laughs> when they were doing the Redneck gimmick, I came in, you know, and just traveling down the road with them and, and stuff like that, and just raising hell and having fun, but being safe, you know, and, or being with my dad. Like this last couple tours, the last couple shows I did with dad, my brother Cody was there, and uh, that's the first time Cody had been on the road with me and Dad. So he had both of his sons there, and it was a big thing for me, you know, that my brother was there too. So maybe the first night I got laid out with a chair, and Cody would come to my rescue, you know, my brother at 19 years old. And then Dad would come back out, and all of us would be standing there. I'm bloody, Dad's bloody, and Cody's right there holding their hands up, two-time state champion right out of high school. And, and just, and he's living in, in uh, California, wanting to be an actor. He didn't want to be a wrestler, but he does, because I know, I see it in him, you know. And he's like, I don't want to do this, you know, but he comes right out there and he's holding up our arms and we get good you know, snapshots from everybody and I make sure I turn Dad around. Get your fat ass around, Dad, damn it. Turn around here. You, know, you, you got your boys here. Let's get the pictures. You got pro illustrated, you know, pro wrestling illustrated. Everybody there taking the snapshots, man. I mean, the first time with, with Dad and his two sons, it was very special for me. And Dad, I don't think it was as special for him because he was so tired and overrun with whatever, I don't know, but man, he had his two boys 
and you had 500 people there. It's not a lot of people, but 500 people and me, him, and and Cody in the ring together is just it was awesome. It was fun for me, and I can't wait to do it again. You know, with Cody, I hope to break Cody in because I know it, I know it's really what he, what he wants to do. Uh, what was your favorite match in the, when you when you were in the WWE? Was there one particular WWE? match? WWE? Yeah, one particular match. From from the first WWE to just any time you were there. I had I had a few. Um, some of my my best matches. Well, I'll say me and Savio Vega. Um, that's when uh, Savio Vega really. He's he's a creditor to getting Gold Dust over as as the heel that he was. Because Savio Vega helped me for months, six months, to get me over like he was. And then also worked a ton of matches with Shawn Michaels. And we had some barn burners. I mean, we had some great matches. And uh, uh, then Christian and, and Jericho, me and Booker, you know. But those three, I think, stick out the most. And then Roddy Piper, that deal, was a lot of fun, you know. But those... And Undertaker too, you know the casket match. Cause I'm the only one who beat him in a casket match. To today, mm -hmm. there's only one person that beat Undertaker in the casket match, and that's Goldust with mankind's help. <laughs> 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 but I beat him. But it was fun. Uh, you have any thoughts on the internet and newsletters? Well, just, you know, I mean, you can't always believe everything on the internet. And you know, my girlfriend now. She'll go on the internet right now and, and pull up stuff that my ex-wife is saying, Terry, she's saying about me or something like this and that, and 90% and of it's just not true, you know. And I'll tell these people, I said, this isn't true, this is not, this is bullshit, this is why you shouldn't believe the internet completely, unless you hear it from me, you know. And, you know, so much of it's bullshit. But a lot of it, 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 you know, is true. But lately, concerning me, it's been nothing but bullshit. So, I mean, the Internet and me right now, I don't like the Internet. I like to watch it. But, uh, you know, it's just everybody wants to eat, take a piece of the pie. Everybody wants to eat up somebody. And I had a little deal, you know, and uh, I've... Uh, I have been found not guilty, but everybody has before that had, had eaten me up and thrown me to the wolves like I was the baddest person in the world, man, for for nothing, you know. And it just it sucks when you got to sit back there and 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 see all this happening to you because everybody else is watching it, you know. Especially you know all the wrestling fans, which is a big wrestling base, and it sucks. When you came into uh, NWA TNA, was there any heat on you because you were the Booker's son? I'm sure there was, yeah. But, I mean, this is the first time I saw a lot of respect from guys. The guys would come up to me, you know, and I could see this like when, when I was in WWF, you know, walking up to Shane, you know, respect, you know, kissing ass, doing whatever, but didn't kiss ass. I could see a lot of that, you know, kissing ass and, and stuff like that. And I never wanted that from anybody, you know. That's not the type of person I am. I'm there to have a good time and to, to put on a good match and have fun. And Dad's a booker and whatever else. Who gives a fuck? I'm having a good time because I know how to have a good time. I can wrestle. I can work because I know I can work. And you know, the crowd out there the first couple of months, you know, who booked this? Who booked this? Who booked this? You know, and... And to me, at this stage of my life, 18 years in the business, it didn't bother me. But you hear it, you know, out there while you're going through the motions. But it's just ridiculous, you know. And you go in the back and everybody's like coming up to you and this and that. And that's when you really see where people kiss ass, you know. And I'm not going to say any one body. I'm just, it's amazing, you know. So, so I saw that side of it. But hell, man, I mean, I don't think of it that way. I think of this business is my my livelihood, man. I mean, I love this business, and this is all I'm ever going to do, you know, as long as, as God is going to let me do this, you know. I'm, I'm going to keep doing it and do it the best I can, get in shape for whatever I need to get in shape for, and, and I'm very proud to be Dusty's son, you know, and 
Uh, I mean, the American dream lived on. It lived through me, and I made my own dream and did it. And I've done my own thing. I've stepped in my own shoes and did created gold dust and did it. Now I'm back to here, and I'm Dusty's son, and I'm more than happy to stand right beside Dad, step in the ring with him, and he is all God Almighty, and and love it. It's great. You have any memories of teaming with your dad at the Hustle Show in Japan? Yeah, yeah. Um, that was a real tough. That was a real tough night for me because I hadn't been in Japan for a few years and. I put that whole mass together. Dad sat in the locker room and I put the whole mass together with the two boys. And I was so nervous just because of the Japanese style and stuff like that. And the, the more nervous you get in the wrestling business, the more blowed up you get. So when we got, you know, actually to the ring and we were doing our match, I just was so petrified or nervous that, you know, I mean, we went through the spots and the motions and things like that, and I was just like, and I was in shape, and I was just breathing hard and hard and hard. And Dad looked at me and said, Dusty, you look like you're about to have a fucking heart attack, man. It was just a stress, you know, and the, uh, the, just the nervousness of it, you know, and being here, being there with him with 45,000 people. And normally I wouldn't think that, you know, it just, it was a Japanese style that, I hadn't done in a few years, and I knew these two guys, you know, it's their top guys. I was like, I'm trying to put together, you know, the best show I can for, for us, for us four. And it just didn't come off that well. But it wasn't bad, it was just, it was a shit. <laughs> wasn't bad, it was a shit. And mostly due because of me, you know, I was just not there that night. I was nervous, stressed, whatever. Do you have any thoughts on doing Steve Carino's World One shows? Yeah. Yeah, I would love to do more of the shows, you know. Um, me and Steve, yeah, I did uh, a couple of shows after after that uh, Japan show, and uh, but I hadn't heard from him since, you know. And I don't know if he has a, a good uh, reputation with Dad still, or if they still talk or what. I mean, I've called him a couple times, left messages. And he hadn't called me back, so I don't know, you know, I'd love to come up here and work for him, you know, or work for anybody, I don't care. I mean, wrestling is my business, and I, and I love to work, so. And it doesn't matter to me about doing jobs and, and fucking, oh, uh, he's going over, or I'm going over, it doesn't make a shit to me. As long as I can put on a good show for the, for the fans out there and they go home happy, that's all that matters to me. It really is. Any thoughts on your series, with your series of matches with Raven? Yeah, the first match sucked. First match sucked, and the truthful God be my witness, swear on my daughter's raisin, was because of the straight jacket. And during that day, um, he wanted to put the straight jacket on me. We we're walking through the, our match. And he wanted to put a straight jacket on me. I've never had a straight jacket on me, so I didn't know. And he put it on me. And he tied it behind my back. And I flipped the fuck out. I mean, I went into a serious, like, <gasps> you know, like a like panicking, uh, hyper con uh, whatever it is. Like, I couldn't breathe. It really freaked me out. Like being, like I guess, buried alive. It freaked me out that bad to where I was getting dizzy and almost fainting. And then... You know, I said, yeah, I'll still do it, I'll still do it, and I gave it to him, you know, the whole day. The whole day I was telling him, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it, but you got to tie it looser. But I was worried, real, I was really worried about it, and that worry led into the match, and you could see it. And it was so scary, man, it was so scary to me to be put into a straitjacket, so, so uh, claustrophobic, you know. Oh my God, it was horrible. And then after the match... As bad as it was, as bad as that match was, I mean, it wasn't a horrible match, but it was bad. But when he got the straight jacket on me, it took forever to do the ending and stuff like that, and I'm breathing like crazy. When finally the match is over and I'm back through the curtain and I'm outside, he comes around the corner, you know, and uh, I'm kneeling down beside one of those big transformers in the back at Universal, and I just start crying, you know, because it just... Uh, 
it that's it's one of those things I mean you get buried alive you, you watch a movie you see somebody buried alive I mean that's scary to you you know but that shit scared me to death so I dropped to my knees and I was crying he says man not a lot of guys have had the balls to do that shit with you and I, I didn't know that I didn't know that you know I don't know that uh, if you get put in a straight jacket most people freak you out I don't know it did me it fucking freaked me the shit out and uh, I was crying, man. I was like, I'm sorry, man. We had a shit-ass fucking horrible match. It was horrible, and I'm sorry, man. And now our next match was a bull rope match, and we made up for it. And we did a good job, you know. When you're in a gimmick match like that, a bull rope match, we made some good spots. We did a good job. So from our ground zero match, or grade zero, to we made, you know, at least a, a B-plus on the, on the uh, bull rope match. So I was happy, you know. Raven's a hell of a worker, man. He is. You have any thoughts on Chris Candido? Yeah, Chris came a long way, and all the, all the th all the things that he has been through in his life, and a lot of people know, you know, the drugs and and the things that he went through in his life, but he got clean, and he came to work for TNA, and Dad gave him a chance, you know, and and Dixie gave him a chance, and he was clean, man, and I could tell it, and. Uh, a fluke happens when he broke his damn le ankle or leg, man, like that. A fluke happened and the blood clot, you know, caught up and he got a staph infection and he died from it. And instead of what you would think of, if you were Chris Candido back in his day, you know, with the drugs and stuff, he'd die of a drug overdose like a lot of the guys do. He died of a, a fucking blood clot. or whatever it was in, in a system and there was no drugs in him and that's what it really shocked you you know it really I mean you went like god damn man that's such a uh, it, that was bad it, it was a hurtful thing Chris Chris came a long way came a long long way What drugs? He died for some, for something that you know you would have never expected him to die from. And we and it was taped, you know, it was a tape show. Me and Dad are sitting there at home, and uh, they're calling, saying, "What should we put in here? You know, since Chris has died, you know, what should we put in here before it airs? Put Chris with the two belts, you know, and uh, the." Uh, the tag team he was with, the um, naturals, the naturals, put him with the two belt, you know, two belts, you know, have that the last shot, and me and Dad are watching it, and Chris is already dead, right, the day before, and and uh, and they called Dad, you know, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do, put him here and there, and now we'll, me and Dad are sitting at his house in Atlanta, watching at Dad's house, watching the match, and this happens, boom. He's got the two belts upon him, you know, and then me, you know, Chris Candido, such and such and such and such, you know. And it was just a real chilling thing, you know. When in all reality, he should have died of drugs, you know. Like most all the other guys, you know. He got clean, man. He cleaned up his act. And he died of fucking bullshit. Mem do you have any memories of your match at Wrestle Reunion with Kevin Sullivan, Abdullah the Butcher, and CM Punk? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I remember I bled about a damn fucking quart or a gallon. Uh, when I first got in the, the ring there with, uh, with Punk, I heard a <laughs> And I looked over and Abby had broken off a beer bottle and went, oh, hell no. You know, and he came stepping in the ring, and I went backed up and went, uh-uh, not yet. It ain't time for me to get juice yet, and you ain't juicing me with a damn goddamn broken beer bottle. Fuck that. So me and Chris did our little spot or whatever, and then I'm waiting. Here comes Abby. I don't know what he has. You know, if he has a, a fork or if he has a beer bottle, because my back's behind, you know, to it. And I'm just waiting. I'm like, mm. I feel the hand on my head. I'm like, mm, here it comes. Two. And nothing even touched me, you know what I mean? Because he's that professional, he's that good, you know. Then I roll over, 
And then I just, I cut and it was just shooting out like my artery, just voo voo, voo voo. And, and Mike and them saying, well, what, hell, Dustin, you can't tag me now. Hell, I'm sell you're selling now, man. You're bleeding too much. I mean, we got to go after this. You know, because it was bleeding. I had to put my hand up to fucking stop it because it was, just, I, had a, I had a vein. It was just popping out, man. And I was like, gosh, dang, I was scared. This is only like two times or three times I've done that. And the, right before that, there was a lady in the, like, the second row saying, what is this shit without uh, Rhodes or, or, or Abdul or somebody in this match going to bleed? And then it happened. And then she started screaming like, yeah! Uh, what's your thoughts on Scott Demore? Scott Demore's a good guy. He's very talented. He's very creative. And uh, from what I know of him, since I've known him at TNA, he's, hey, he's got his head on his shoulders. He's got good direction. Terry Taylor. Terry Taylor, same thing. Terry Taylor's been around a long time. He knows what he's doing, you know. He can tell some good storylines and create some good stuff. Bob and Dixie Carter. Bob and Dixie Carter. Uh, I really know Dixie more than I know Bob. I only met Bob a couple times, but Dixie is very sweet. She's a very sweet lady to be in such a high position that she is to own the company, you know, the Panda Energy. Uh, when you would think a person like that would be more hard on their employees, you know what I mean? Like, you need to do this, you need to do that. She's very sweet and kind to everybody, which, which gives everybody that, that kind of relaxed feeling she did. And it's good, because you need a person like that. How do you think TNA is going to do on, on Spike TV? I think they're going to kick ass. I think they're going to kick ass, and, and it's not going to be very far before they're on Monday night, head up. Head up, man. War to war. Thoughts on the Jarrett's? Which one? Oh, uh, Jerry and Jeff? Oh, Jeff. Yeah, but Jerry what and Jeff. Yeah, what, what's your thoughts on them? What do you think, you know? They they brought it to the dance, you know. They brought, and they found they, they found the Carters, and they've made this company where it's at, you know, with the Carters' help and stuff. And Jeff is a great talent. He's, you know, my age, and he's a veteran, too. So, and Jerry, he's got a great mind like, like my dad does, you know. It's, it's like father, son, father, son. And uh, I love them both. They've always treated me very well. And uh, hopefully, you know, this week I'm going to be talking to them and get back on the road with them so I can get on Spike again. In uh, Jerry Jarrett's book, he basically calls Vince Russo a fraud. Do you agree? This is in Jerry Jarrett's book. Well, he says, what did he say? Well, how did he call him a fraud? He basically said he's, he's just not good for the business and... He just, he was not good for the business, and he's a, you know, he's a, basically a one-hit wonder, and, you know, he really didn't do for the WWE, and it was more Vince. Well, I'll tell you about Vince Russo. Um, first Gold Dust round, 1996, when I started Gold Dust, Vince Russo, he wrote a lot of my uh, scripts for my vignettes. All the vignettes I did, you know, starting as Gold Dust, Vince Russo did, and I give him credit for that, you know, but giving him credit for writing those stuff, it's one thing. I did them, though. I made them. I pulled them off. And then Vince Russo, you know, kind of shunned me towards the end here when I came back to WCW and I was trying to do a new gimmick, Seven, which was going to be a hell of a gimmick, and he shut it down before it got started. So Vince Russo, you know, ins and outs, you know, we had, uh, but I'm not going to say anything bad about him, you know, I, I have my personal feelings about him, you know, he's, he did a little good for me, I did good for the company. Can a southern style of wrestling still get over today? The southern style of wrestling? Yeah, like that whole, can, can it get over today, you think? Like, like what kind of, like, uh, explain that to me a little bit, I know what you're talking about, explain it to me just a little bit though. Yeah, that's what I, can you, um, I'm, I'm really, I, I'm, guess, I don't know how well, like I guess Rocket more of a... Wrestling. Like yeah. what? More like Crockett, but it just... They didn't really do too much like what it was. like the old NWA? Right, yeah. yeah. More of a straight baby face than, than him. I think it can. I think it can. I mean, it all goes in cycles, but you got to realize we got di different generations growing up, you know. The generations now, they don't know Dustin Rhodes. But a lot of people know Dusty Rhodes, you know, he's fucking very recognizable. 
and it's it's amazing but to tell those kind of stories I think it might be a you know a 50 50 chance because to hold the peoples to captivate them during a storyline for that long you know you can't go out there and do an hour Broadway anymore I don't think unless you have two good some bitches you know like Shawn Michaels or Hunter who could do to tell a story like that you know but the old school will never die I mean because you need that because that's where you learn you learn your old school ways and then you you fall into the new school and you mix them both and and you take both of them and you create something that is fucking awesome but bringing up a Crockett kind of style right now yes I think I think it can happen but you got to have you gotta have knowledge of the fucking new school to do it. You have to have knowledge of the new school to, to kind of blend in there with it. You know, like a soap opera, you blend in the new school, the new talent, the new storylines with it that that'll shock people. In, in, your, in your dad's book, he put a lot about your, your yours and his relationship. Were, yeah. you, were you supportive of that? Only about, you, about our relationship? Yeah. Were you supportive that he put it, that so much in his book? Well, you know, that was his book and his deal. I mean, me and him, or him and I, we, we had a falling out, you know, and we didn't talk for five years, and it was tough. And then when we finally got back up together again, it was a 30-minute hug, embrace, crying session, and now we'll never do it again, you know, one of those kind of things, you know. You got a dad, you have a father, you need to, whatever, what whatever the son's doing wrong, whatever the dad's doing wrong, it don't matter. You have one dad, and that's your only father, you know, and you need to make the best of it, because I'll never let that happen again with me and my father, because it was bad. Okay. Um, what happened recently when you were arrested on domestic abuse? I was arrested uh, after the uh, uh, April 24th pay-per-view. Had a hell of a match with Bobby Roode in a cage match for 25 minutes. We had two out of three falls. I was really high on it because it was one of the best matches I've had in a few years. And uh, my daughter was here, or was uh, there with my girlfriend at the Hard Rock Hotel. And they were they had been swimming all day, but my, my girlfriend had been drinking all day and doing drugs. Doing all kind of drugs, you know. And my daughter is 11 years old, you know. she's. And I get back to the hotel, and, and uh, my daughter's just starting to lay down in bed and stuff. And, and uh, one thing leads to another, and, and, and I hadn't had but like a couple beers in me. I'm just talking to my girlfriend about what a great match I had, you know, and how high I was off of it, how, how, what a good feeling it was. And she's just getting belligerent and yelling and screaming. And I had a suite. I had a suite at the Hard Rock Hotel. And she, you know, she for some reason she got mad and went to the other room with Dakota, which they had two twin beds in that sweet room. And Dakota's almost asleep. She's watching my DVD player, and her DVDs. And I sat there for you know a couple minutes. I said, I, uh, she's she's over the line right now. So I walked in there. I said, Dave, you know, you need to get out right now. And she walks out of the door. I said, Dakota, you stay in here, okay? Don't open the door. Close the door and we walk down the hall towards the uh, open of the door. I said, You need to get out right now. And she starts screaming and yelling. And this is God's honest truth, okay? It's God is my witness I, I'm, on my daughter's life. I swear this. You know, this girl's screaming, yelling, and she starts calling my daughter's name. And I pick her up around the waist, which I know is assault. I mean, Grab somebody like that, just like that. It's assault on a woman. It is. In Florida. You grab one just like that. It's assault. I picked her up and set her outside my hotel room. I didn't want her there no more. I said, get out. Put her bags out. Five minutes later, the cops came to my door and they arrested me. And uh, my daughter is still in the hotel room, you know, with the door closed. And, and I went to jail and, you know, all the stuff happened and this and that. I stayed in jail for 72 hours and and right after the pay-per-view and dad told a lie for me saying that uh, I was sick. That's why I wasn't at TV taping. And uh, 
uh, got out of jail and I had, when I, when I went into jail, I had my, my, my uh, cell phone. They took it all, they took everything, right? And uh, I had two two uh, voicemails on there, you know, and she was saying that, you know, she was giving me death threats, this woman. She was bipolar, crazy ass, fucking nutty bitch. And uh, somebody should have slapped me. Somebody should have slapped me way before I even should have met this woman, you know, because I, I don't know what I was thinking. And uh, I got out of jail, and you know, and I just now, I'm just now getting over it. And uh, it's like two weeks ago, I just now have been found not guilty, you know, going to the final trial and shit like that, and it's just ridiculous. But my daughter has been yanked out of my life since April 24th, and she was with me. My daughter's been with me every other week, week on, week off, since me and Terry have been divorced. She was yanked out of my life just because of this shit, because of this woman. And I didn't do nothing. I didn't do anything. And still today, now, I've had eight conversations. To this day, I've had eight conversations with Dakota. And that is my life, my baby. My, Dakota's my life. She's been yanked out of my life, and I can't see her. And now, you know, Terry's stipulations is I have to see her in a uh, a supervised center, you know, and, until I get through with my anger management courses and bullshit, you know. And it's just ridiculous because when you do nothing wrong, just like I said, you just grab a rest. And it's called assault. And I was, I, I found not guilty for nothing. And she's been taking her my life. When I've had her every other week, 50% of the year, for a whole week, every other week, taking her to school, doing this, doing that, paying for everything, paying child support too. And she's taking her my life and I haven't seen her since then. And it's just real hard, man. What did you think of ECW's One Night Stand? I didn't even see it, didn't give a fuck. Would a WCW One Night Stand work? No, I don't give a fuck about that either. Okay. Um, why did your tenure in, in, the, in TNA come to an end? Why did what? Why did, your, why did your time in TNA come to an end? It hasn't. Okay. She, Dixie Carter, after this uh, thing here, until I got cleared, which being not guilty has uh, just gave me a absence of leave. So I've called, left messages, and hopefully I'll be back on TNA real soon. What do you think of Ric Flair still wrestling regularly? Do you think it's time for him to step aside? Nah. As long as he can do it, man, everybody loves Ric Flair. Why would oh I'm sorry Dustin? You go through any arena and he steps in the ring and everybody's woo and doing that shit. Everybody loves Ric Flair. Why were you able to to make it where someone like a David Flair or a David San Martino didn't? Right now, I think that uh, putting an organization together or even a TNA or whatever, put David Flair in there and put him under my direction and let me help him, I think Dave Flair would be a great wrestler if he listened. Do you want to write a book someday? I'm writing one right now. It's a different book than you'll be used to though. <laughs> Do you think that the <clears throat> WWE is pushing more of the guys um, with yes. the physiques? Yes. And they shouldn't be? 
Could you have cut it in tough enough? Probably not. But I did pay my dues, man. I paid my dues in 1988, 89, and 90. Paying your dues, making twenty dollars a night, driving from town to town, barely having gas money, and getting the shit kicked out of you, or wrestling, or learning the ropes. That's paying your dues. Cut, you know, tough enough. That's just where they make the spectacle of them beating the shit out of you, and you making it like like some Marine Corps type deal. You know, you know, fuck that. That's good for these guys these days. That's what it takes. Uh, paying your dues like we did, it's a little different. Paying your dues that way, still, you know, that's good for them. They need to pay their dues. They need to get the shit kicked out of them stretched. Did you ever feel pressure to take steroids? No. I took steroids one time uh, a long, long time ago, like 1990, and I just drank beer. I took steroids and drank beer. And I just got fat as hell and mean. I just got mean, man. The Anadrol 50s, they fucking made me mean as hell. I mean, I honk at somebody, I'll pull over and get them out of the car. Get the fuck out of the car. Just just yelling, you know. So that's, you know, I, I didn't take steroids. I don't lift weights very much. Yeah, I do some dumbbells and uh, uh, the uh, treadmill. That's all I do, you know. Or, or uh, what's that? That uh, standing. Stand, oh, Stairmaster? Uh, stand no, not Stairmaster, the elliptical or... Uh, it goes back and forth and up and... The gazelle thing? No. Not the gazelle, no. but it's like that. Yeah. That's no. all I did with like, those. Are you prepared for life after wrestling? Right now I'm not, no. I don't know what the fuck I'd do without wrestling. What I'm trying to figure out, you know, I I got a choice right now to go open up a school and run some shows, sell some shows. Is there anyone you didn't get a chance to work with that you wish you had? Man, I worked with Rick. I worked with uh, Sean. I would like to have worked with Bret Hart a little more when he was a world champion and maybe gone done a little angle with him, you know. Uh, but ultimately, I'd like to have been in, back in the, my dad's day, you know, to work with Harold Grace and stuff like that. Because those are the good days. I mean, shit, those days are long gone, but. Hunter, I've worked with a billion times. I beat him fucking 50 million times before he became Triple H. I beat Steve Austin before he became Stunny Steve Austin. I was United States champion. I beat Rick Rude. I beat them all. When my dad was a booker, but who cares? I beat them all anyways. I did it. But I could do it. I was a natural at Dustin Rhodes. Would you like to induct your father into the WWE Hall yes, of Fame? Definitely. I, I, I want to be the first person, the only person to induct him. Are you surprised that Bret Hart came back to do a DVD with the WWE? What DVD? Bret Hart? He's doing... I thought he had a stroke. And well, no, Bret Hart is doing a, the best... Didn't he have a stroke, though? Yeah, but that was a couple of years ago. And uh, Is he better? He's doing better. He's doing actually better. Uh, but he, you know, they had a lot of issues, which everybody knows of. Yeah. And he yeah. now he's, they were doing a best of Bret Hart. Yeah. And he came back and he's working with them to... to that would be great. Yeah. I think everybody should do that. All the guys that work there. The best of Gold Dust, you know, best of Bret Hart, the best of Shawn Michaels, the best of whoever. If you had to go back to the Indies, could you make that adjustment and go back there to work? But that's what I'm doing right now. Hmm. It's the Indies and right now it's not paying worth a shit and uh, my uh, truck is going to be fucking hauled off probably Monday if I don't make my payment so and my house is about to be foreclosed on you know and I'm trying man I got some bookings coming up you know any bookings but it's tough you can't just go get a job anywhere you know when, when all you know is wrestling when is it right and when is it wrong to get color if you're old school like me and you're uh, independence and stuff like that, 
and it's right because you know it's right because the people I mean you just you know you know when to do it and when not to do it if you're in the mid card if you're at the beginning of the card you don't do that shit but if you're in up the main event and I'm a dad to say he gets Abdullah the Butcher and whoever else Kevin Sullivan you know you gotta get it you have to do it but you gotta do it in the right place and it's always right you know and and people love that when you were in TNA, who did you enjoy and what enjoyed most wrestling? Bobby Roode. And Bobby how about, Roode. How about least? Did you have one? You just no. And I, I really enjoyed working with Kid Cash too. Speaking of Cash, what did you think of him as a worker? And I wish he would stayed around. He was a hell worker. Mm -hmm. God dang, he could fly like hell and, and do some good stuff. Psychology, he was good right there. Uh, his partner, the big tall guy. Uh, Dallas. Lance White, man. Dallas, he kicked my head off one night. We were in a tag match. And I told him, I said, I can't still talk because I, I, my head just, I ribbed him for a month, you know, because cause he fucking super kicked the side of my head, you know. But uh, Kid Cats, man. And then he left for whatever reasons. I don't know. I don't even know why he left. But, uh, I mean, working with Bobby Rube was, was fucking fun, man. He he's got it. Bobby's got it. So I mean, most most of Team Canada do they have it. What do you what do you think of America's Most Wanted? As a Good guys too, man. I think they should be heels though. Stone cold heels. I worked with them as a six man, you know, but they should be heels. They got their good look, you know, and everything like that. And they helped me get over just a little bit, just me being with them in the six mans. And uh, it was cool to be with them, you know, do our vignettes with them in the back of the truck and stuff like that because they're cowboys, you know, some little country boys. But they're heels. They're heels of the bone, man. They need to be heels. What did you think of the time that you were teamed with Cassidy, Cassidy Riley? I like Cassidy. Cassidy's a fucking good hand, man. If, if uh, I don't, what's he doing now? He still works the team. Yeah, he still works, eh? Does he? Yeah. They need to push him a little more because he's a hell of a hand. I mean, he is. He and and me uh, saving him on those couple of times, you know, and doing doing what it did for him. I mean, it was good, you know. And Cassie Riley, man, he called me the other day too. What do you think of the What do you think of the X Division in TNA? I like the X Division. It's different. It's different, you know. You got six sided ring. You got that X hanging up there. That rope, which looks like it's going to break if a 300 pound gets up there, it's going to fucking snap. Them motherfuckers get up there and climb it like a damn spider mm -hmm. and do backflips off the some bitch, you know, AJ and Daniels and them. And I'm like, God dang, they land on their necks and they'll get up and crawl back again. It's different to climbing a fucking pole or climbing a ladder to get the belt, you know, in the middle of the ring of WWE. The, the, the belt's right there in the middle of the X, you know, on the four poles. It's very different. It's cool. It's going to add a new deal, which I think is different than WWE. That's what's going to set them apart, WWE and uh, TNA, you know. You have the X Division, WWE's ladder match. And the X Division, the guys that can do it, it's fucking phenomenal. Do you think AJ will have a long career? Yeah. Continuing to do those kind of moves? Yeah. Even though the high risk of that? Of I sure person. do. He's a hell of a hand. He's a great talent. Christopher Daniels, too. What do you think of CM Punk? He's good. I, I, I also like Monty Brown. Monty Brown's a hell of a hand. That's something that's going to spare you from the side and just fucking throw you through fucking ten rows of seats. <laughs> <laughs> you see, he gave da Diamond Dallas Page the one spear. I went, God damn, he speared him to the fucking rope almost. I went, fuck, because it's coming from the side. You know, it's it's heavy duty, man. Monty Brown's a hell of a talent. He's he's an athletic bastard, man. I mean, he's good. He's gonna be good. Right direction, right direction. I'm gonna throw some names out here, just you know, quickly yeah. looking. Magnum Tia. Well, I was in high school when Magnum had his wreck, you know, and when he was at his peak, or doing the stuff he was, he would have been so unbelievable. I mean. Just the way he was, unbelievable. His body, the way he worked, the way he caught on to the work, you know, and unfortunately, car wreck, you know. Tully Blanchard. 
Todd Blackson one of the greatest heels in the business. Greatest. One of the greatest. Ric Flair. He's still going strong and still can get the people up and and still can get heat without a ref saying or without anybody saying, you know. It's great. Greatness. Booker T. Booker T is uh, Booker T. I love working with Booker T. Booker T right now, I think the stage he's in, he's probably getting ready to like want to settle down and and uh, his family and stuff like that. And but he can go with the best of them. Barry Windham. Barry Windham, the, the, the one man that I learned everything from, is cleaning up uh, hurricane debris right now. You know, and working little shows here and there. But uh, he, I learned everything I know from him. And if there's ever a tag match involved with me and him. It's it's awesome because Barry, I learned everything from him. He's he's like my mentor. Terry Funk. Terry Funk is I've had so many matches with him, been out of his house so many times. He's like a, a brother and a second father to me. I love him. Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan, a uh, great icon, did 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 for the business what what he has done and it speaks for itself. Um, never got real close with him, but uh, he's Hulk Hogan. Shaw sure, Michaels. Shawn Michaels, me and him had some tremendous matches together. One of the greatest workers in this business, and still one of the greatest workers in this business. I still go, and uh, any time I could step in the ring with him and still do what he can right now is saying something. A couple more. Black Jack Mulligan. Black Jack Mulligan, Barry's dad. He's you know, he's hunched over. He's had his he's had his uh, run in the business, and you know he's retired. What a big bastard! You know, it's like Barry. He's just uh, his his run come has come to a, you know an end. The American Dream, Dusty Rhodes. Dad's still going strong, man. But all he has to do is tag I tag him in. He'll come in and give some fucking elbows, flip flop and five, four year nuts, and boom, drop the elbow. One, two, three. We get paid and go home. Do you want to ending up? Do you want to say anything to your fans out there, or you know, message to anybody? Well, let me close up. I just want to say that, hey, you know, um, I know there's a lot of people out there, a lot of uh, marks, a lot of uh, internet marks out there that don't like Dustin Rhodes, that don't like me for whatever reasons. Uh, I think I have uh, proven myself time and time again to um, new heights and uh, am one of the greatest workers in this business today and that, that there's nobody's going to take that away from me and and there's so many stories on the internet that some some guys put out there and not all of them are you know bad you know all, all the guys are bad and I'm not saying the internet guys are bad I'm just saying not all of you are true you know and you need to believe in something you need to believe in your heart and soul like I do and this business is my blood it's my heart and soul and I believe in it and I do it better than a lot of motherfuckers can and hate me or like me. If you're talking about me, good publicity is bad publicity is good publicity. Publicity is publicity. And I'm there. And I know I'm always in the thoughts. And I always want to be in the thoughts of the fans. And I love you all for supporting me and taking care of me for all these years. Thanks, Dustin. Hopefully uh, we'll see you in, the, in Oklahoma and make a new promotion. And uh, maybe you'll be the big three one day. Hopefully. Thank you.